Welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the inner workings of the creative process. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. We can all point to people who had an influence on the direction of our lives, from how we think about ourselves to the choices we've made. Trudy Cunningham is one of those people for me. We met when she was the Assistant Dean of Engineering at Bucknell University, and I was a freshman with delusions of solving the world's problems with talents I didn't completely have. Calculus, I'm looking at you. I wanted to talk to Trudy because she had been a math teacher before becoming the Dean of Truth and Trouble, and I was curious about how that jump happened. I also knew she would have a lot to say about creative problem solving, and indeed she does. We also talked about the creative side of teaching and advising, and I think you'll find her insights into what makes people tick particularly fascinating. Here's my conversation with Trudy Cunningham. Trudy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> to talk to you because you like you have such such a varied range of interests and things that you've done, and I'm really curious to learn more about all of it. And so let's start with, you know, were you a creative kid? Um, I think creativity for me is uh, like um, invention. Uh, mm -hmm. Necessity is the mother of invention. And um, I grew up in a family, a large family, as it turned out, um, in which I was the first girl. My father had four sons, my mother had three of those. And um, my father was a traveling salesman. So he was gone all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the wonder to us children is how he conceived us. <laughs> <laughs> and our other uh, assured assumption is that when we travel the world, we should look for people who look like us because <laughs> They probably are related to us. <laughs> um, my father loved people, especially women. And um, he loved to enter, well, not entertain, he loved to spend money. Uh, I don't think so much to impress he, other people as to impress himself. And he had no compunction at all about spending money he didn't have, which made my mother's life pretty scary. Yeah. Uh, and he moved us out of New York City when I was five going on six, and my mother was pregnant with her sixth child to a suburb of Long Island, to a house that cost $13,000. And if he made a down payment, I'd be surprised. And so we had a mortgage that had to be met every month and he was never there to meet it. Oh. Um, so my favorite brother, George, was a paper boy. He took on an extra paper route so that he could have enough to pay the mortgage when needed, which was most months. Wow. Um, so like, creative, um, it, there, there weren't a lot of options for regular creativity. Um, and so I think that's where I probably got into problem solving, which is uh, using desperate or creative means to solve the problem of being bored or angry or uh, left out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I so wanted to be a boy. It, <laughs> it was palatable. <laughs> By the time I was eight, I could pee standing up. <laughs> <laughs> One of my greatest accomplishments. <laughs> um, but my mother was a master at problem solving. Um, the school district we went to was public, but it was new and it wanted to be upscale and most everybody else had money. We didn't. <laughs> um, and so the boys had to wear long sleeve white shirts to class. Uh, well, we didn't have long sleeve white shirts and couldn't afford them. So at least once a month, my mother and I would go to the Salvation Army, be there when they opened. And they, they back in those days, they had bins. Mm -hmm. and so my happiest memory of my mother is the two of us digging through the bins, looking for any long sleeve white shirt. We didn't worry whether it would fit the boys now because it would eventually. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, um, then every morning we would get up and iron. If my father was in town, we'd iron 
four for the older boys and one for my father. Um, although the pops were always short sleeved, but he liked them ironed very carefully. Um, so we'd iron four or five shirts every morning. And, and I remembered saying, wouldn't it be easier if we just did this on Saturday and ironed enough for the whole week? She looked at me and said, well, you'd only have to iron once, but what would happen to those shirts? <laughs> I said, I don't know what you mean. She said, your brothers would try them on and they would all end up on the floor. They would wear the last one. And it wasn't, she, <laughs> she didn't reprimand me. She just said, you have to look at a problem from a different way. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I still love to go thrift store shopping because I think when I'm in the thrift store, my mother's with me. Mm -hmm. And both of my daughters who have more money than I do um, love to go thrift store shopping. So the three of us still have a ball, especially in New York. <laughs> wow. When this pandemic is over and you're back in New York sometime, I'm coming with you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know the best spot. <laughs> I bet you do. But I'm glad that you brought up the problem solving angle, because as soon as the words were out of my mouth, are you a creative kid? I thought, what am I saying? Every kid is creative. Of course you are in one way or another, whether it's dancing or painting or figuring out how to iron fewer shirts or, you know, whatever it is that you need to do to unbore yourself or, you know, whatever it is that comes up. Every, every kid is creative, but we don't think of creativity in a problem solving sense often enough, I don't think. Well, the one creative thing I, I remember doing as a child um, is I wanted to learn how to paint. I, I, I liked pictures and um, I wanted to do, I didn't know the difference between oils and watercolor, <laughs> but I wanted to paint pictures, but that really wasn't an option. Uh, so I went into the kitchen and got food coloring. <laughs> but that didn't work very well with water. So I got the white shoe polish for my baby sister's shoes and mixed the food color into white shoe polish and, and did some rather lovely things. I bet. And my mother was so impressed, she bought me oil paints for Christmas, which must have taken a month's grocery money. <laughs> and I hated it. Wow. It wasn't nearly as much fun as the shoe <laughs> polish. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how often that's true? Yeah. The thing that we come up with ourselves is much more interesting than the thing that somebody else says, this is how you should do it. Right. You own it. And uh, yeah. So I don't know, maybe sometime, sometime soon, I'm going to get me some white shoe polish. And try again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be very curious to see what you do with it when you do. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when you went off to school, what did you go for? Well, first I went off to high school. Um, which was public, um, and this this will surprise you, but at school I was a terribly quiet. Well, I'm not sure shy. I'm not sure any I could ever be accused of being shy, but I was very quiet at school. And most people who know me find that just <laughs> ludicrous. Um, but the reason I was so quiet was the three brothers ahead of me were not only noisy but we're troublemakers. And so I remember clearly when I got to junior high, um, a teacher going, oh my God, another bender. <laughs> Hand on her head. And from then I just didn't say a word. <laughs> um, and somehow by not making noise, I became the girl bender who was smart. Mm. Now we have the same parents and <laughs> Having watched us grow up, I know that we're equally bright, if not, you know, th th there was no difference there. Um, and so school was a release, a relief for me. To, the boys were old and old. Well, they weren't so much all that older, but they dropped out of school pretty fast. So <laughs> they weren't much around when I got to high school. And um, the teachers encouraged me because they thought I was smart. And in particular, uh, a math teacher, uh, Mr. Parsons taught me geometry. And 
he, I learned a lot of geometry from him, but I, what I really learned from him is that there's more than one way to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And although math books and mathematicians um, honor the short, elegant method, the long around the barn method is just as effective. And I always went around the barn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and my classmates would howl. I mean, they just thought it was so funny when we, it was, you know, the T-form proof and we had to put them on the board. And whenever I got called to the board, mine would go on and on. And, on. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids would giggle and Mr. Carson would read them the right act. And oh, good say, for him. This is equally, unless she's made a mistake, this proof is equally good, as good as that one. Uh, and then he would go through every step and celebrate that I hadn't made a mistake when I hadn't. <laughs> um, and I mean, he gave me two things. One, not to be embarrassed mm -hmm. uh, by doing it the long way. And two, I was convinced that if he could teach me geometry in that setting, where I felt bombarded by my quote friends, uh, I could teach anybody math. It just, I mean, it's just math would be an easy thing to teach. And at that point, <clears throat> there were three choices. You either got married, you were a nurse, or you were a teacher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no other thing. Well, I guess you could be a secretary, but um, typewriters terrified me. So that really wasn't, <laughs> wasn't an option. <laughs> um, so in that class, I got the answer to the question, which my teachers were asking me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and you know, get, getting married and being a mother of 12 children was not an acceptable answer even then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I wouldn't say that. I would say, I'll, first I, I said, I, I, I'd like to be a nurse because I'd like to help people. And then I spent a summer as a, with a job at a tiny uh, private hospital. I think I was 15. And I worked the shift from seven to 11. Is that right? No, I worked the 11 to, 11 to seven shift, the overnight shift. Um, and first they had me on the wards with people who had had surgery. And I loved that because I could talk to people mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and made a lot of friends there. And then I made friends with Aunt, little Ann who had had surgery and we were enjoying so much. It, they just assigned me to be with her overnight and she died and I lost it. I just, I yeah. couldn't handle it. So they moved me to the nursery <laughs> <laughs> where, and I, I can remember two things. Um, one, one, my class, not my classmates, a, a senior who was pregnant came in and delivered and screamed the whole night. And she was a very elegant senior. And it, I, that, that made it quite an impression on me. Uh, but the most fun memory was that the babies would cry and, um, I was taking an English course with my favorite teacher and sure that poetry was the absolute solution to the world. And so <laughs> I would rock the babies <laughs> and feed them and, re and, and recite poetry to them. <laughs> um, which probably didn't help a whole lot, but it made me feel better. <laughs> there you go. Kind of hurt. <laughs> uh, but in any case, where I was going with that is that uh, senior year, um, the teachers started asking me where I was going to college. <laughs> college? What's that? <laughs> um, so when they figured out I didn't know about college, uh, they figured out that I should go to a teacher's college because I wanted to teach. And they, they agreed that nursing was not really a good choice for me. Uh, so they arranged and had me admitted with a scholarship to State University of New York at New Paltz, I think it was. And um, they were so excited and, and I was so pleased that they had done so much for me until I figured out the only people who went there were girls mm. who wore dresses and curled their hair and wore makeup. And I had worn dresses all my life, but I was really looking forward to not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I didn't wear makeup and I had curly hair and had never curled it in my life. Um, and I just, I mean, going to college was scary, but living with girls was a lot scarier. <laughs> um, so I called my brother, George, who had then, it's a long story, but he, but he barely graduated from high school, went to work as a draftsman and fell in love with his boss's daughter, who was an, the boss was an engineer. So George figured out to marry Heidi, he would have to go to college. He didn't want to go. Um, and by fluke, he got to the University of Chattanooga on a full scholarship where he worked 40 hours a week as a draftsman and they paid him to go to school full time. Nice. And he was a senior married to Heidi with the third child on the way uh, when I was a senior in high school. So I called George and told him my problem. And he said, don't say anything to the teachers. Uh, give me a couple of days and I'll call you back. The next morning he went to see Dean Mildrum uh, and said, four years ago, you let me in with bad grades and no money. I have a sister with good grades. And Mildrum convinced the committee to write me a letter, admit me and give me enough money to go to Chattanooga to a co-ed school. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, it's my whole life. You, know, you began by saying I've had a wide range of experiences and responsibilities and almost all of them, each of them kind of sprung out of solving a different problem. Mm -hmm. Most of them were not part of the plan at all. For me, there's creative problem solving, which says you look at a problem, make sure you know all the information that's in the problem including how you're related to that problem and what your, your constraints are. And then you use what you've got. You can't solve a problem with stuff that you don't have. So wishing that right. I was rich or wishing that my parents had gone to college or wishing for anything is useful. Look at what you've got and take your chances <laughs> and be prepared to be surprised. So that to me has been the thing I've tried to teach much more than mathematics. I mean, math is an okay thing to teach. And it, it's lovely in that using the rubrics under mathematics, I can teach problem solving and I can teach creative problem solving that has nothing to do with mathematics. Mm -hmm. So that works pretty well for me. So can you give us an example of what that might look like? I mean, are you doing that at the same time, teaching both kinds of, of problem solving with the same student? Or is that totally separate things? No, it's, it's, it's never separate. Um, let's see, I can give you lots of examples. Uh, probably my favorite one um, at Swanee, maybe year three, uh, we had um, an alum found a lost boy of Sudan mm -hmm. in, in Atlanta who was bright and essentially paid that kid's way through. So brought him to the university. The university decided to take a chance, and then someone's going to pay the tuition. Sure, um, and in part of my role at that point was teaching, but was also um, special advisor to admissions and the deans um, because of my work at Bucknell with as dean of truth and trouble. <laughs> and um, so I. I worked with admissions and the dean and suggested we put them in my calculus class uh, because that, that might be a pretty hard course and at least we could be on top of it. So on day one, his name is Emmanuel Solomon and he came in and sat in the chair by the door. <laughs> so, you know, symbolic, like I can bolt if I need to. Um, <laughs> and Joel and I were team teaching. So Joel went into our standard thing, which I think he learned from me. Uh, which is to explain on the first day that calculus is a mountain. There are 32 of you. It's important to us that all 32 of you get over the mountain. The problem is even with two of us, we can't do that. So to get all 32 of you over the mountain, you need to help each other. And to help you do that, we want you to learn each other's first and last names. And so as has happened in some of your other classes, you're gonna introduce yourselves. The difference is on the first exam, uh, 10 of the points will be for you naming three people in the class, first and Ooh. last name. And on the second exam, it will be 15 points. And on the final exam, it will be 25 points. 
Ooh. So listen up. Mm -hmm. And to help you remember, when you stand up, we'd like you to say what your name is and then something interesting about you. Weird would be good because weird things are easier to remember. <laughs> and so Joel turned to Emmanuel and said, sir, would you start first? And Emmanuel, who was about five, seven, and, but also older clearly than everybody in the class, except for the teachers, stood up and with great dignity said, my name is Emmanuel Solomon. I am one of the lost boys of Sudan. And an interesting fact is I don't know how old I am. And he sat down and nobody did anything. And so I stood up and said, we need to start over again. I don't think you heard what Dr. Cunningham said because I don't think you wanna be in the position of failing this course because you didn't get 25 points that you could have gotten on the final, do you? Well, no. And I said, well, then you should be taking notes. Oh, out come the notebooks. I said, Emmanuel, would you start again? And so he stood up and said the same thing. And somebody said, how do you spell Emmanuel? <laughs> and I said, how do you spell Solomon? And you know, this had nothing to do with calculus. Uh, so as you might expect, the next gr girl sitting next to him was a freshman and she stood up and very sassily said something and sat down and the girl next to her did the same. And the fourth student was the redheaded, freckle-faced freshman son of the woman who's now my husband's uh, assistant. And he stood up and said, my name is Patrick Solomon and he's my brother. <laughs> and it literally changed the whole class. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it, of all the classes I've ever taught, it became the most connected. In large part, because of Emmanuel, um, on the first exam, five kids failed it badly and several others came close. Well, for Swanee students like Bucknell students, failing a math exam is... <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we have, you know, my other problem solving thing for mathematics is if you're worried about failing the course or you want to do well, my suggestion is that you do your homework in my office until you feel comfortable. And in my office, I had a, a long table with a seat six or eight comfortably. And in the middle of the table was a large jar of animal crackers. And so the rules were, you come in, you introduce yourself to me, although I know who you are. You go to the table, if there's someone else there, you introduce yourself to each other. You sit down and go to work. And while you're in my office, you may say nothing negative until you have eaten two animal crackers. So you go to work on a problem and when you feel like you need to say something negative, you have to eat two animal crackers before you can say it. And what happens is the animal crackers have enough sugar in them and the freshmen particularly have to decide whether to eat the feet or the head first <laughs> after they've chosen the animals. <laughs> and by the time they put the first cracker in their mouth, they're laughing and then they go back to work and they solve the problem. I mean, it just, it's like they quit bitching and they, it works. Mm -hmm. So that helped the people who came to class, but the five who failed probably didn't come to my office to work. And the second test was coming and I get an email from Emmanuel <clears throat> saying, well, I should also note, he made the highest grade on the first test by quite a lot. Turns out when they were marching across Sudan, <laughs> Uh, and into a refugee camp. He was a math teacher in the refugee camp. Ah. Uh, so testing was, he was used to making up testing and taking them was no problem. So I get an email from Emmanuel who says, dear Dr. Cunningham, in class today, the other Dr. Cunningham mentioned that you would be traveling for the rest of the week. I'm concerned about the students who failed the first exam. Would it be inappropriate for me to offer to tutor them while you're away? And I wrote back and said, it is very appropriate. May I announce it in class? <laughs> and so I announced in class and put his name and telephone number up. And from that moment on, he tutored those five kids for the rest of the class. They all passed. <laughs> and I'm quite sure for those five kids, and I would guess for many others in that class, 
what they remember is not anything about calculus, but about Emmanuel reaching out. When we were supposed to be helping him, he was Mm -hmm. (laughs) doing much more for us. I don't know. I'm not sure that's quite the example you wanted, but there it is. No, that's really interesting. And I I mean, I'm sitting here listening to this and thinking, I don't remember you telling me freshman year at Bucknell to come and do my calculus homework in your office. And I don't remember there being a table like that in your office at Bucknell. But if I had, I have to think I would have done better. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I'm not sure I did it at Bucknell. For one thing, I didn't, I I taught math that, what, 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 when did you come to Bucknell as a freshman? 1989. 89. Okay. By then I was Dean. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't teaching calculus. So I, so you wouldn't have been eligible yeah. had I did on it. But I didn't teach. I taught full-time calculus for a year and a half uh, before I became Dean of Arts and Sciences for a semester. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> and then moved to engineering. <laughs> so I don't think I did that until I came to Swanee, where Southern students, well, Swanee students are equally bright as the engineering students at Bucknell but they're also more vocal about being terrified of not making A's. Mm. Uh, So uh, I think I just invented that in response to terror. That makes sense. And I also had a big office, which was nice. (laughs) Yeah. But it's, it's interesting because I am, I'm, I'm flashing back to the spring of, of that year when I came up for an open house with my dad and one of my best friends wanted to be an engineer and and she was so clearly you know i would sit in english class and go shakespeare awesome and she'd be like what is this bizarre foreign language and why do i have to read it you know but but we were best friends anyway and you know having grown up with an engineer and and all of the like the problem solving stuff i love that stuff and i think that i had this idea in my head that if i became an engineer I could go help solve all the world's problems. But in my head, that did not include, you have to pass calculus first. You know, it did not include, remember how math has never really been your favorite subject or your strong suit. And so I remember we came into your office that spring and my dad had this idea that this was the end of the world because he had let me not take calculus in high school. And, you know, I had kind of viewed it as an accomplishment that I got out of taking calculus. (laughs) And it was. (laughs) His deal was, you cannot take calculus, but then you have to take, and it was, you know, very, very basic, literally basic language programming on the Apple Mm IIe. And I think I took it the whole year because that was, that was the deal. He was like, you still have to do something that will teach you to think logically. So if you're willing to do this, then you don't have to take calculus. And I was like, heck yeah, (laughs) there's just no question, you know, but he had this idea that I was way behind and I needed to make it up over the summer. And I remember sitting in your office and he was saying, I think we're going to go down to the bookstore and buy the calculus textbook. And she's going to learn calculus over the summer. And I just thought, what (laughs) like and how is this miracle going to occur you know and you said I really recommend you don't do that because the kids who come in having taken calculus and have to take it again don't do as well as the ones who are taking it for the first time and I don't remember what he said to that but I remember that we as soon as we left your office we went to the bookstore and he bought the book and he went home and came up with this calendar with sections of the book in it that I was going to teach myself from the college textbook that is not really meant to have anyone teach themselves anything. And absolutely, this was all very, very well intentioned, but it went probably not as even as well as you'd expect. There were tears many, many, many Mm -hmm. times because it was just, it was asking me to learn Russian without even having access to the alphabet in in advance, you know? (laughs) And so he eventually called the teacher that I had had for algebra two, who he'd had for trigonometry. And I just remember (laughs) her telling me, because 
I ended up going and working with her for the rest of the summer, which was so much better and so much easier yep. than trying to teach myself calculus out of a book. And I remember her telling me when I walked in that, you know, she got this phone call from him and, and she said, when he explained what he was trying to do, she, he, she said, that's a beautiful idea, but it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> and I felt like I actually understood, you know, the basics of calculus one or whatever when I arrived in Lewisburg. And then I got into Mike Ward's class and that was the end because going backwards was so hard. And that was when I understood that that must've been what you meant, you know, yeah. going, going back to the beginning and having to do all of it again was just like, but I know how to do this thing now. Yeah. And so doing it this other way doesn't but there's make as also much sense anymore. The, uh, the, the same issue that comes up with the animal crackers, which is if you have seen derivatives before and you've done integration and you know the secret, then you are convinced you don't need to practice derivatives. Mm -hmm. And you're right if all you're gonna do is integrals. <laughs> but, but if the first test is on derivatives by not practicing derivatives you're shooting yourself in the foot and and you know it would <laughs> yeah calculus was at Bucknell was the only class I've ever flat out failed in my entire life well it, but that was true well, I think uh, actually uh, organic chemistry probably has the, the the longest string of failures probably but, but calculus is is second or third and Many of them are kids who took it in high school, which is really embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes sense to me having had that experience, even though it is blissfully long enough ago. <laughs> well, and especially for the years, you know, you had calculus, you had some kind of engineering, you had physics mm -hmm. you had English, which for you was okay, but for right. years is pretty heavy. Um, and so if you don't have enough time, it's obvious you don't do the calculus. You know that. <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's not the way it works <laughs> yeah but I I what the other thing I remember was that Mike Ward had told us that if we did not know the fundamental theorem of calculus on the final exam he would fail us mm -hmm. and I remember walking in for the final and I think it was a Saturday exam just to add insult to injury and I he thought he was funnier than he actually was <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at the top of the exam and in you know, 1989 dot matrix print, it said final extermination. And I thought, you know what? That's not funny when you're afraid you're going to fail. It's really not funny when you're afraid you're going to fail. And then I looked down the page and I saw the question that said, what is the fundamental theorem of calculus? And I thought, mm -hmm. of course, this would be the one thing I forgot to review. So I suspect that that sealed my fate right there. Yep. Though the third time I took it, I barely paid attention in class and I still got a B, so something must have gotten through. <laughs> well, I think the piece you haven't factored into that, uh, which is the other part of why I tell parents don't teach your kids anything, particularly math, um, is the complicated formula of parental love, jealousy, anger, and need to get even. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, the reason you didn't review the fundamental theorem of calculus is subconsciously you had a way to get even with your father for having made you, made you <laughs> ruined your summer. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, but <laughs> I think it's there. <laughs> it might and be. And it's not an unloving kind of revenge. I mean, the other thing I've seen so often is that Kids cannot be good in math because their father is, and they don't want to risk doing better than he did. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> because that would not be respectful or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that was my problem, but I can see how it could be somebody else's. Yeah. No, it's just, the, the parental relationship is so complicated to start with. I mean, the two things I told parents at Bucknell, um, I'm, not in my office before you, came, you were admitted, but um, when parents came to deliver their kids and we you know, took the kids off to orientation and I'd have a, a session with the parents and they'd, say, they'd wanna know what they can do to help their children. And I said, well, actually, I'm glad you asked that question. There are two things you can do. 
Uh, you can avoid helping them with mathematics and let them figure it out themselves, A. And B, well, and that gets translated into, they will have other problems besides calculus. Uh, some with alcohol, some with sex, some with who knows what. And the way you can help most is to say, I love you and it's your problem, solve it. And stop trying to solve their problems like you've been doing most of their lives, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's been, it's normal up to now, but now if they're gonna be engineers, they need to learn to solve problems. So this is a safe place for them to do that. You're paying a lot of money, let them do that. They didn't hear that one too well. The one they heard <laughs> though, <laughs> and I said, and then the, the second in a different category, the main thing that you can do, especially if you're, engineer as a male, uh, is do not get divorced during the next four years. If you're unhappy with each other, uh, just hang on until they're graduated. Because my experience is when a male engineer's parents divorce, he's a problem solver. He has to go home and fix it. Oh, yeah. And his academics fall apart and he can't fix it. And it, it, it just ruins uh, more careers than uh, you might imagine. <laughs> they look at me like this is a weird woman. <laughs> and yet that makes sense, especially if there's, you know, that kind of pattern that's unmissable. Yeah. Yeah. And I have found, you know, the, the engineers that I know have a hard time with things they can't figure out how to fix. Mm -hmm. Or if they figure out how to fix it, and are blocked from that path. The other uh, wonderful one, my wonderful sad, I don't know, I don't remember what year it was, but the single best electrical engineering student we had, I mean, he was head and shoulders above everybody else, just splendid, um, came into me his spring of his junior year and we celebrated some award he had just won and talked about his future. He was gonna go to graduate school. And he said, well, that's the really the reason I came. I wanted to tell you about my plan and make sure it's okay. And so he laid out a plan where he would take a year, a gap year between junior and senior year because he had grown up in Maine in a poor family next to a yacht resort. Well, I don't know what you call those places. Um, and he had worked from the time he was 10 on yachts. And he was an engineer but a boatman at heart. And his lifelong dream was to sail around the world, but he wanted to be an engineer. And he knew as an engineer, he would never do that. Mm -hmm. And so he had figured out the solution to his problem was, and he had already talked to some owners of boats he had worked on. And he had two offers to sail around the world on their yacht, but he needed a, almost a year to do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think it's a splendid idea. You know, it's brilliant. You've you've been, you've identified the problem. You've identified the <laughs> solution. It doesn't cost you any money. Yes. Let's do it. And he said, "Well, the only problem is I don't think my parents will buy it." And I said, "Sure, they will. Let's call them up." <laughs> so we called <laughs> first dad, then mom, <laughs> and I explained it to them and just supported it all the way. And they said, "Well, we'll think about it." And they called me back the next day and said, we've thought about it and said, he can do it, but he has to graduate first. And I said, that is a mistake. In his head, when he graduates, he's an adult and he can't do his boyhood thing. Mm -hmm. And I urge you <laughs> in the strongest way to trust his judgment. You know, he'll, he, he's a good student. It's not that he's gonna not come back. And they stuck by their guns Oof. and he bailed out first semester of his freshman year, of his senior year. Oh, I mean, it was just, it was so sad to watch. It just, he just couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He was so, I don't know, disappointed. His heart wasn't there. Uh -uh. And so he, they let him take off second semester. <laughs> Actually, they pulled him out at Thanksgiving, so he wouldn't fail. And he sailed, he didn't manage to get all the way around, but he joined a boat and came back and then did fine his, his second senior year. <laughs> Oh, well, that's good. So at least that wasn't the end and, you know, a no. totally tragic yeah, it, story. Well, yeah, it, it didn't end in a suicide, which was where I was worried it might go. Yeah. <sighs> Some of us are pretty stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. And I, I think you might be in there with me. <laughs> 
Well, but you know, I'm also not to like keep bringing this back to me, but I'm also wondering now, you know, how many times when you were at Bucknell, did you end up saying, it's okay, I'm going to call your parents with you? Because certainly, I mean, I did not get to the end of the semester before it was abundantly apparent that I was not going to be an engineer. And, you know, I came to you and said, now that I went and got my dad's hopes up about this, I don't know how to tell him. Mm -hmm. And you said, go back to your dorm, pack a bag, you're staying with me tonight, and we're going to call your dad. Mm -hmm. And, And it was so much better than it ever would have been if I had tried to make that phone call myself. I'm not even sure I would have managed to get the words out. Yep. on my own. And I mean, you didn't even think twice. So I'm sure that I was not the first person that you'd had that conversation yep. with. You must have had a heck of a lot of moral support that probably wasn't even in the job description, but you were doing it anyway. Yeah. I mean, as I've told many people, the my, my favorite title ever of all the jobs I've ever done was the engineers calling me the Dean of Truth and Trouble because it was <laughs> what I did. <laughs> and but I think it, it really does go back to the training from my mother and from Mr. Parsons and that if I see a problem, whether it's mine or yours or something, that guy over there, to recognize A, there's a problem and B, it's not my problem. So the person who has the problem has to A, recognize they have a problem and B, they need to look at what their resources are and figure out a solution. But I can, as a bystander, uh, listen to their possible you know, ask them for more than one solution and say, well, of the three you've given, I've seen the first one fail eight times <laughs> and the second one four times, but that third one might work. So to, to, to help them sort of prioritize what they're going to try first. One, one of my fa- other favorite ones here was my office was near the Dean's office and Swanee has a student administered honor code, which is taken really quite seriously and quite effective. And so when somebody is accused of cheating, they come before students with a faculty member in the room who has no vote (laughs) and they can be kicked out of school. And so I watched, I'd see these sessions start and I'd always sort of hang around and I'd walk to the restroom and just make sure everybody's okay and that the parents have not brought lawyers, which they sometimes try to do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I, as I was going to the restroom, I saw this girl, girl I did not know bolt out the door into the quadrant and burst into tears. And so I followed her and stood a, you know, a COVID distance and said, are you okay? And she said, no. And I said, well, you look to me like you could use a hug. Would you like a hug? Yes. <laughs> so I gave her a hug and patted her on the back and said, it's really okay. I know you're sad about leaving school, but if you pay attention to what they tell you, you'll be able to come back. And she looked at me and she said, it's not me. It's my boyfriend. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wrong problem. (laughs) (laughs) Oh dear. (laughs) The, the interesting thing that's also occurring to me that I feel like I should say for anybody who's listening to this is that the reason that I didn't end up just plain leaving Bucknell or having trouble or anything else was that I was not fool enough to go in and say, I'm just going to be an engineer. I was, however, crazy enough to say, ooh, that five-year arts and engineering thing sounds good, which having a brother who did a five-year architecture program, when he got to the beginning of the fifth year, he was like, I understand now why it's four years. (laughs) But, But as a result, that meant that you know, I could just say, I'm not doing the engineering part anymore and I'm out of here in four years. But if I hadn't done that program, you would not have been my advisor. I had three advisors that first Mm -hmm. year. I had the engineering advisor, the English advisor, and you, and you were the only one I ever went to. Well, God herself does work these things out (laughs) (laughs) in ways we don't usually appreciate. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I campaigned for a long time and never succeeded. Um, Uh, So I may have to leave them some money in my will, but I wanted there to be a scholarship for the fifth year program or Mm. or for for kids who, who either knew coming in, they needed it, but more importantly for kids who, after they got there, knew they needed it. Uh, And so it would be a scholarship for the fifth year, Mm -hmm. essentially pay for it. So the parents couldn't say no. Right. Um, I I never quite pulled that one off. (laughs) (laughs) 
but it is you know in retrospect it is quite the stroke of luck because otherwise you yeah. know I would have just had an engineering advisor who probably wouldn't have had the faintest idea what to do with me because aside from say you're not in the right place dear mm -hmm. and and that would have been that well you know the engineering faculty didn't quite know what to do with me either <laughs> <laughs> well how did you end up being associate dean of engineering as a math professor well the, the, the first question is how do I end up as a math professor and I didn't do my doctorate until after I had two children <clears throat> and I wasn't planning on doing a doctorate um, I had we did our undergraduate degrees in Tennessee we married the week after graduation and then Joel was going to graduate school in Oregon so we went together and I taught junior high for two years and senior high for two years and was happy as a clam. But <clears throat> while we were out there, the math department chair called me and lectured me about not making Joel drop out of school because some other math graduate student's wife had talked her husband into leaving. And I said, do you, have you met my husband? <laughs> No, Joe Cunningham, you know, this is not really an issue. And he said, well, I'm calling all the wives. And I noticed that you're a math teacher. And so I think in your case, I can help. Uh, this summer, you're going to go to graduate school. I said, I am not. And he said, yes, you are. And he said, I have a, a National Science Foundation grant for teachers. And I would put you in the program and pay your way, except you've only taught one year and you need to teach two before I can pay you. So you're going to pay this summer and go, and then next summer I will pay you. And I said, we don't have money for that. We barely have enough money to, to pay the rent and pay Joel's tuition. It's not covered with his grant. And he said, well, in that case, you just go ahead and pay it. And at the end of the summer, I always have money left over. I'll just pay, pay you back. So I told Joel about it. He said, well, I, I think maybe you ought to do it because you, I don't want the chairman mad at me because you didn't do it. So that's how I got my master's degree. <laughs> and then we went to, Ch we ended up going to Chattanooga, back to Chattanooga, and I was planning to teach in high school and all the public schools had no openings. So I applied to the Baylor school, which is an old, old boys, <laughs> <laughs> junior and senior high school. And they hired me to teach eighth grade math because I couldn't find a job at the high school. And I was happy, I love teaching eighth graders. That's actually my, probably my, the best thing I've ever done. And I was having a ball. And then Joel was chosen for a fellowship at, a national fellowship at Knoxville for the American Council on Education to see if he would like to be and would make a good administrator. So he was going to Knoxville. We were living in Chattanooga, three hours apart. No problem, I have two kids, I have a job. You just go on. And the American Council on Education said, oh no, no, she has to come with you. And the children have to come because otherwise you won't really know whether you can do this because it's mm. a strain on the whole family. So we rented out our house. We moved to Knoxville. There were no teaching jobs because there are so many graduate students with wives. And, and I am afraid of staying home with ch small children. So th there was nothing else to do. I just enrolled and I was going to do a second master's degree. And they talked me into doing an a doctorate in education because I already had a master's and I could do it in two years or something like that. And there was a woman who was chair of the math department, Lida Barrett. She hired me to be a graduate teaching assistant and I taught calculus for the first time and loved it. Graduate school was okay. I didn't love it, but it was all right. One of the first courses I took that year was statistics and it's not my strongest suit, but I like it. And I was pretty good at it. And it was a class for teachers and principals and other administrators at the public schools. And they didn't like it so much. <laughs> and we came for the final and I went, I went to class about 10 minutes, to the exam about 10 minutes early. And they were passing around in the halls the answers to last year's statistics final. Principals, oh. teachers, beg your yeah. pardon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, I was astounded and angry. So I marched into the chair. I didn't go to the faculty member. I went to the chair of the department and said, I'm not going to take this exam. This is ridiculous. And he said, oh, but I want you to take the exam. Uh, we're aware of what's going on. 
and they think they're getting the same exam. <laughs> it's a very different kind of exam that they're about to receive. <laughs> but anyway, it, it made me unhappy. Um, right. So the following Monday, I went to lie to Barrett and said, uh, I've decided to drop out of graduate school. Uh, this is not for me. I don't need it. I'm an eighth grade math teacher. I love what I'm doing, but I also love teaching calculus. So for next semester, could I teach two or three classes instead of just one? Elida looks at me and says, no. And I said, why not? <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, there are two reasons. The first is you are a graduate teaching assistant. If you are not a graduate student, you cannot be a graduate teaching assistant. But more important than that, as best I can tell, you're going to follow Joel Cunningham around for the rest of your life like a puppy dog. <laughs> there will come a dime, mark my word, when somebody wants you to do a job that you could do today, but without the doctorate, they won't be able to hire you to do that. You are not dropping out of graduate school. You will teach one course next semester and finish your doctorate. End of discussion. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> So that was 76. And in 79, Joel was called to Pennsylvania to be first dean and then president of Susquehanna. And I was, I mean, I, I was really happy for him because he, it was, he needed to make that change. And I was excited to go to Pennsylvania, be closer to New York. And I knew it'd be easy to find a job teaching junior or senior high school math, but there wasn't. And hmm. I went to the to interview at the school system where we were going to live. And the superintendent looked at me funny and said, why are you here? And I said, I'm, I've applied to teach secondary mathematics. And he said, well, we don't have any openings in secondary mathematics, but of course, if we did, we wouldn't hire a woman. <gasps> this is 1979. And I was sitting down and I stood up and said, excuse me? Did you just say you wouldn't hire a woman to teach mathematics? And he said, yes, is that a problem? And I said, do you expect me to enroll my two daughters in your schools? He said, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> of course not, of uh, course but, not. But, but we don't have any jobs. And so the only reason I came to Bucknell is because there were no high school jobs. Lida Barrett <laughs> <laughs> called a former student of hers who was David Ray, the math chair of the math department at Bucknell and said, can you help this woman find a job teaching secondary mathematics? And he said, I don't know anything about high school math. Can she teach calculus? And she said, yes, she taught for me and she's very good. And he said, well, I have, you know, a faculty member needs medical leave for a year. And so if she could teach calculus, I could rearrange the schedule and we wouldn't have to do a national search. So that's how I came to Bucknell. Wow. And I taught, I was to teach for one year. I was non-tenured. I was, it's kind of a, an emergency hire. Mm -hmm. But David liked the way I taught and he especially liked the way I listened to kids and solved their problems. So he didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so he arranged for me to be a visiting assistant professor. So that was 79, 80, 80, 81. And in the, in the spring, my third year, I guess, I got a call saying that the, the new president, Dennis O'Brien, wanted to speak with me and could I come at three o'clock? And Dennis was an absolute piece of work. I mean, he's one of my favorite human beings in the world, but he, he said, thank you for coming. I know you're busy and so am I. So we'll, we'll make this short. I don't suppose you know, but the Dean of Arts and Sciences has decided to go to Japan next semester and we need to replace him. And so I've called you here to see whether you would be willing to step in and be Dean of Arts and Sciences the next semester. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's one of two times in my life I've been surprised. One, when Joel proposed him. <laughs> and Dennis where I'm, I, I, I was speechless. I said, beg your pardon? He said, you look like a woman with questions. You may have two. <laughs> and I said, do you know who I am? <laughs> And he said, yes, what's your second question? And I said, why me? And he said, why not you? <laughs> I said, well, I can think of 10 why not me's and they're all tenured male professors. Oh, he says, I've thought of the same 10, of course, but they all would want to keep the job. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is for one semester only. Um, so I would like you to think about it. 
Uh, and I don't, if you're going to turn me down, I don't want you to tell anybody else because I'm gonna to have to ask one of those 10 and that would not be so good. So you may talk to David Ray and you may talk to your husband, but please don't discuss it with anybody else. <laughs> so I agreed to do it on two conditions. One that I not see the salaries of those 10 professors or any other tenured professors. I did not want to know how much those people were making. Mm -hmm. And two, that I not sit on the tenure committee and, and make decisions about who should be tenured because I had never been tenured and I didn't right. think it was appropriate. And he said, yeah, that makes good sense. It'll be tricky, but we can do that. You're going to be good at this. <laughs> so I sat, I was Dean and I sat on the President's Council that semester. And I sat next to Barry Maxwell, who was dean. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to me this was my chance to have that dean's ear and explain to him that the way they taught engineering was unforgivable. <laughs> and so, yeah, I just told them that they were ruining kids' lives by forcing them to choose which engineering they were doing before they came in when they had no idea, no, no information to base that choice on. And the ones who made the wrong decision left. And essentially what you're doing is taking the brightest kids that come to Bucknell and beating them up and making them think it's their fault. And I said, that's, you know, if, if you were paying them, maybe, but they're paying you a lot of money. And uh, Barry thought that through and decided that made sense. So he got permission from the university to have a dean, called me up and said, I'd like you to be the new assistant dean. And I said, you can't do that. <laughs> Why not? And I said, well, even if I didn't sit on the affirmative action committee, <laughs> which I do, that is a new position and it has to be advertised nationally. You can't just, and he said, but you're a woman. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> but I don't really have quite the credentials that you might be <laughs> needing. So <laughs> they did the national search and I was one of three finalists and I got interviewed. No, first he called and said, okay, we've interviewed the other two and we've decided we want you to do it. And I said, well, I'm glad you interviewed the other two, but I couldn't possibly decide whether I could do this without interviewing you mm -hmm. and the department chairs. Oh, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so I got interviewed by Sloniker and <laughs> Master Scusa and, uh, oh dear, the civil engineering, Jay, um, J. Kim was the most memorable one. He said, well, I'm not really comfortable with this. So I'm going to just be honest. And I said, well, Dr. Kim, why are you not comfortable with this? And I thought he was going to say, you don't know anything about engineering, which would be a fairly logical thing to say. <laughs> he said, I'm afraid I won't be able to cuss in front of you. <laughs> and I said, well, you may be relieved to know that I have five brothers and that I've been cussed in front of before. <laughs> And he said, well, in that case, it's okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, this makes so much sense to me because I was in the, uh, the inaugural Engineering 100 class. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I have to assume that that's how that class came about. Well, you were in the one that were taught, was taught by engineers though, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the five departments taught it. Mm -hmm. Well, how it came about was... The first year I was assistant dean, I'd sit in the meetings with the chairs and say, you got, you got to do this, something different. This is not working. Well, we've always run it this way. <laughs> That's how I was there. <laughs> and so Tom Rich was taking over as chair or somewhere in there. Barry was my dean the first year and I don't know, the second year maybe, I don't know, with the transition. But anyway, either Barry or, or Tom said, why don't you design a course? and teach it as a freshman seminars, I think they were called. And so the first time it was taught, I taught a section for arts and science students called Introduction to Engineering. And that was a freshman seminar. And Dean Rich, although he may have been a professor rich at that point, maybe before he became Dean, taught a section of mechanical engineering, engineering, and we met together and used my curriculum. Mm. <laughs> and something like 10 of my 20 something students switched to engineering and most of them were girls, Ooh. which sweetened the pot quite a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then Tom became Dean and he proposed to the, to, to the chairs that we use the money for, from some grant to 
to design a real engineering course. And you know, their position was, well, yeah, we can do better than that. And I said, of course you can, you know, you're engineers. I was, I, I was making this up off the top of my head. Uh, so they did it, but they let me teach in it. And they let me, the piece that I think you got to do, and I don't know how many, I don't guess they're still doing it, but one of my favorite pieces of that was the lab where we took the broken things apart. Uh, I would collect broken appliances and machines from the faculty and staff and the kids would come in and there'd be a broken machine on a round table in the big meeting room. And as you came in, we said, find a table. Your job today is to take it apart and answer these questions. And it was just fun to watch kids come in and the, particularly the girls who would say, do I have to do the hairdryer? No, you don't have to do the hairdryer. <laughs> I definitely don't remember that. I would have loved that. Yeah, well, yeah, that was, I like that one a lot. Yeah. Anyway, it was fun. It was uh, in, interesting times. There's, there's one other thing that I have to ask that you sort of had to be there for, but that's why I'm asking <laughs> for, for people who, you know, weren't me in 1989, the rock, the rock that you had in your office. Yeah. I would love to know how you found that rock and how you decided to use it the way that you did. And I'll let you tell that story if you want to. And if you'd rather not, I can. Well, I, I'm not sure I can remember how I found it. But actually, I don't think I found it. I think a student did. But do you remember that the rock sat in a, an antique box of yes. geometric forms? Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you the story of that first. When I moved from math to engineering, I think her name was Holda Magelheis, was the first woman professor in biology who was a good bit older than I, and she was retiring the year I was moving to be dean. She and I shared an impish quality. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we met, we just, we, we enjoyed each other a lot. We'd, we'd have lunch a couple once a month or so. And so she, when she was cleaning out her office, she, she called me and she said, I'd like you to come over here. I've got two things I'd like to give you. And this was also on my desk. One was a three-dimensional cylindrical slide rule from 1920 or so, I don't know. <laughs> and she said it had been her father's and he had given it to her. And she was going to give it to the archives, but it would be put in a box and nobody would ever see it. Would I be willing to take it and put it someplace in engineering because she thought the engineers would enjoy it? She picked up this box of geometric things and she said, and I don't want you to forget that you're a mathematician. I tried, wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so take this this is sort of the foundation of mathematics and particularly of geometry. And I know you love geometry better than anything else. So I would like you to have this personally as a gift from me to you. And, but the other thing probably needs to stay at Bucknell when you leave. So on my desk was that slide rule and this box of objects. Mm -hmm. And the slide rule appealed to the real problem solving engineers, the engineers who, who, who have trouble with Shakespeare and, and philosophy mm -hmm. and anything else. I mean, the true engineer, the, that, that, that slide rule was for them what it was all about. But for most of the kids, the thing that was more interesting was the box of solids. And particularly for male, it's interesting, women students, even, even first semester freshmen, women students are very different from men. They, they know there's a problem. They may not recognize quite what the problem is, but they believed I would help them recognize what the problem was. And once they recognized it, they would work with me to figure out how to solve it as fast as possible. And they would do that with eye contact, with full voice. And it was, it was a really efficient process. <laughs> with the male engineering students, it wasn't so efficient. They would look at their laps and their voice, the tone of their voice would drop almost a full octave. Not wow. so much the volume, and I was beginning to have some hearing issues. And on my side of the desk, it was, I know they have a problem. I don't know what it is. And I know better than to ask them to say it again, because mm -hmm. they won't, they'll leave. And so I got, so when I was in that position and couldn't quite figure out what it was we were talking about, I'd say, why don't you look through that box and show me your favorite one? And they would take it and we would talk about that and that they could have eye contact for. Mm -hmm. And while they were holding it, I'd say, now tell me again what the problem is. And sometimes they could do it. And sometimes they couldn't. <laughs> and so I would say, okay, I think you need to think some more about this. And we need to talk again tomorrow. Why don't you take that piece with you and bring it back tomorrow? Okay. And so by doing it, I knew they would come back because not all males would. Mm -hmm. 
And that became sort of one of the things I did. And so sometime later, three seniors came in and said they had a serious problem and they needed to talk to me. And the problem was a fourth senior who they were sure was become, had become an alcoholic. Mm. And he wasn't doing his work and he wasn't, he was just, his life was going to crap, but he denied it and would not seek help. And so we talked about it and I said, well, I'd love to help him. If you think me walking into your (laughs) room would help, I'll go. But, and they said, no, that won't work. And one of them said, how about I take one of these and tell him to bring it back to you? Okay. (laughs) And so it, the knowledge of that box of things was strong enough that the, the kid who said, why don't I take one, knew that he knew what it was for. And he, he thought if he gave it to the other kid, the kid would understand he needed to come see me. And he did. He came and we, you know, we were able to get him some help. And so anyway, that's the, the background of the rock. Somebody who had taken, one of the males who had taken the thing at least once <laughs> and brought it back, went somewhere on spring break. And I'm, I'm thinking it was Texas, not Florida. But he came back with that holy rock. (laughs) And he said, when I saw this on the beach, I thought of you and I thought of your box. And you always see the holes in us and convince us we're strong. And so I wanted you to have this rock. And I said, put it in the box. (laughs) And that's how it got there. But I don't, I don't, were you the one who broke it or was it somebody? I was not the one who broke it. Somebody, I I don't know. I would bet money that it was Oliver Hassey who broke it. Okay. Well, we might have to be in touch but, with Oliver. And check that out. <laughs> but what I, what I do remember, and the reason that, that it sticks with me is that, you know, undoubtedly when I was having, I'm sure I had more than one crisis of confidence that semester, I came in and I was sitting there and, and you pointed to the rock and you said, you know, pick up that rock. And I did. And you said, now that rock is full of holes. And I'm sitting there thinking, yes, I'm not blind. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you said, so try to break it. And I'm sitting there going, oh, okay, okay. And of course I couldn't break the rock. And then you said, that rock is full of holes, but you can't break it. You may be full of holes too, but it's okay. Cause it's not going to break you. And then Ollie broke the rock. <laughs> but until <laughs> then it was just such a fabulous metaphor. Yeah. Well, who, if it was Ollie who got it, he, I, I gave had him choose he broke it in two pieces and he took one piece and left the other piece for it. <laughs> <laughs> well that seems fair <laughs> and I, I came close to bringing that box with me but I decided it needed to go in the to say it in the book now so I don't have the rock I don't know if the, I, the rock probably didn't stay in the box but I don't think I have it I should go back and look at my memento box and see whether it's there <laughs> yeah. but I just uh, I, I do I feel like that's such a great a great metaphor for yeah. you're stronger than you think you are. We are. All of us are. Yeah. And this, this last year has certainly proved it in so many times. For sure. Is there any general advice you would give to someone who, who needs a little boost in their, in their confidence or their problem solving skills? Well, probably the reminder I would give everybody is that lack of confidence is not restricted to the young. Mm. And it follows you through life. So the more experience you can get, <laughs> gain in recognizing when you feel not confident, treating it as a problem, looking at the resources that are open to you and coming up with not one, but three solutions to that problem because <laughs> <laughs> usually the first one doesn't work. The, it's like anything else. The more practice you get, the better you are at it. So instead of feeling annoyed when you can't do something, if you can look at it as a chance to get more experience, it goes better. So for me, the, you know, all those years of helping or watching you and others solve (laughs) problems makes it easier for me at my age. I mean, I I can remember when I turned 70 thinking, wow, (laughs) this is going to be hard. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I'd already given up the job I loved and, and I could see then that, I mean, I, I, I worked a long time, taught for 45 years. So, and particularly the last 20 of those years, Joel was so involved with traveling for the university that most of the traveling we did 
was for the university and I could talk him into doing something added on to that. And that was okay. And that was great. But there were things I wanted to see and photograph. And at 70, I realized the window to do that is mm-hmm. shrinking uh, because we go, we do it together. And the likelihood that by 80, both of us would be able to travel was diminishing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I started thinking, I really do did think of it as a window from 70 to 80. And now I'm thinking 85 to 75 to 85, but I know I'm, I'm kidding myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but by doing that, by identifying that problem, g- giving it a dimension, I could then ask the question, okay, of the resources I have, what, what's, nothing's in my control, but <laughs> what's in the possibility of things I could affect? Mm-hmm. And so, again, working with people, with donors who were a generation two ahead of me, we've seen a lot of people age and die. And it, either Joel Cunningham or Trudy Cunningham don't understand where we're going. Uh, we're stupid. <laughs> and I'm not stupid. I mean, I may be silly, but I'm not stupid. But, uh, the first thing I decided was falling down is not good. People mm-hmm. who fall go downhill. Mm-hmm. So at 70, I stopped wearing high heels. I got rid of all my high heels except one pair of one inch shoes, which I only wear for photographs. <laughs> and that was that was a big decision so I and I went from that I went from all kinds of shoes (laughs) to a pair of old lady shoes that tie and are I I just feel much more stable in them Mm -hmm. and we had already by that time settled on walking three miles a day or at that maybe at 70 we were still jogging yeah I think we were (laughs) <laughs> that was not good um <laughs> but anyway we, we we were jogging and, and we still walked three miles a day so the shoes became my first step the three miles a day becomes as important as breakfast mm-hmm. and I think it does make the, the biggest difference in our health um what else have I done the hearing aids I had done earlier so I got I went from regular hearing aids to ones where I can hear my phone in my Mm. Hearing aids, uh, which simplifies my life a lot. I don't know. So, at the problem solving that I did early on and taught others to do, I'm still doing. Mm-hmm. And I think it makes this time of my life a lot more manageable. And so, I would encourage you, at young as you are, <laughs> <laughs> to not hide from things that scare you. And on a good day, to try to celebrate them as uh, problem solving opportunities. Thank you so much for doing this. I loved it. That's it for this week. Thanks so much to Trudy Cunningham for talking with me. If you like what you hear, please do subscribe and review the show and pass it on. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. You can find show notes, the six creative beliefs that are screwing you up, and more at fycuriosity.com. I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at fycuriosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.